Next on Primary Care, we went to the campus of Wayne State University to speak to Jamela Lilly of the Detroit Parent Network about achieving health equity in Detroit. It's people with talent and purpose coming together. I think that's our opportunity. Hi, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, your host of Primary Care. We're here today with the president and CEO of Detroit Parent Network, Jametta Lilly, who was one of the speakers at the Wayne State University Healthcare Summit 2022 on campus today. Jametta, welcome so much. Glad you're giving us a few minutes of your time uh, to talk about these issues. Uh, as we were stating earlier, you, you, you struck a chord with me in your comments uh, this morning. We have got to advance what we're doing in terms of all of this activity. We've got a hundreds and thousands of people working toward disparities. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. We've got people working on all the issues from pediatrics to, to old folks. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we, we, we've got all of the budgets. We've got all of the titles. We have no outcome. Where, where are we going And it's the same wrong? on same it, 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 Exactly. Where are we going wrong? Well, I think there, there are two things. And I think I, I tried to say this um, in the session that we have almost a tale of two cities. We have healthcare systems and processes and rules and regulations and systems in place that are in the large part self-perpetuating and are not informed or even governed by the voices and the, the specific needs of the people that we need to serve. And that means parents, that means all income groups, that means facing the fact that in a city like Detroit, that we have an extremely high level of poverty and all of the social determinants of health that then require us to modify how we do business. And of course, if we're not talking about equitable funding for healthcare, where everyone has access to quality care, then we're continuing to uh, just stay on the hamster wheel and all those health disparities will continue. So I, I think that fundamental willingness to address the issues of equitable funding and also to rethink the fact that we need to have a real health caring system versus a sick care system. So let's put the plug in. Tell us about Detroit Parent Network. Yes. Uh, so I have the joy of, of having been there now about four years and get to bring the lens of my background both in public health, behavioral health, and also working as a change agent in, in education. What attracts me and what is so powerful about Detroit Parent Network is we are about educating, equipping, and empowering parents to be champions for their children. And I'm really so pleased to say that we are a black-led institution that is now 20 years old. And what we've done during this period of time is that we knew we had to pivot to not only continue to support parents in the way that we do with training, with literacy programs, is to say how can we help to mitigate COVID? So we have worked across the table with uh, community-based organizations, other community-based organizations, healthcare systems, with the support of philanthropy, which is so important as a, a disruptor to, to provide funding. Um, and what we've done is create mechanisms. Uh, one is our COVID-313 Community Coalition, which has reached almost 500,000 people since the, uh, the pandemic started. Uh, and we talk to people, we find out, we bring in people like Dr. Vitti, uh, DPSED superintendent. We bring in a Senator Peters. We bring in parents to talk about what is that you need around health, uh, education, social justice, and basic needs. Um, and then Detroit Parent Network, uh, we do things like bring our children to sit down and have conversations with pediatricians about what is the vaccine. Uh, because in order to change the paradigm about hesitancy, people in the community be, have to be able to sit across from you as the trusted source and ask their questions. And we've seen that make a difference. Right, we, 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 we raise these families, these things called children that you know we get involved with, and we become their teachers for the first critical point of their life. Now, yes. I mean, you know, we, we, we are- We're it. We're it, okay. Then we hand them off mm -hmm. to systems, for lack of a better term, yeah. that don't quite do what we were doing at home, right. or we encumber that with us not doing our part at home as parents also. So yeah. we've, got, yeah. we've got these things called kids who don't quite get it at home, mm -hmm. don't quite get what they need in yeah. school, but we're expecting them to achieve, we're expecting them to understand, 
how do we get back to, hey, this is how I make you what I want you to be, okay, then it's in the formative years of your, yeah. of your life. Well, it's really understanding how important, in particular, those first, those first three years of life are for brain development, but also how we can help parents better understand how they can talk to their children, how they can engage their children, what are good child rearing practices, how to make that home a literacy and learning environment, and at the same time, hold school systems and others accountable, accountable. Yes. to say, my voice needs to be at the table or at least make me welcome so I can better understand and be a real partner. And, and that's one of the things that's important. But I think we have to remember is that our families are just not the same. I mean, that's you true. and I probably grew up in a village. We grew up, in, I grew up in a household, two family flat. My, my, my aunts were downstairs. And if I did something wrong, everybody knew it before I got home. Well, the neighbor it, would tell your mom you it, did something Exactly, wrong. and I knew that I couldn't talk about that. That, that, that paradigm has changed. Um, and so what, we're, what we also need to say to our families and to parents is that you are the most enduring person in the life of your child. So that means how can you begin to model? We have to pivot our focus on not just children, because that's important, it's critical, but we have to give parents the support, the education, the opportunities for economic mobility. And if we're doing that and giving health care as part of it, we're going to start seeing changes in communities. Um, because I think we keep forgetting that if we look at all the data, families that are educated, families that have a better economic well-being and in environments that are safer for them, safer environmentally, have better outcomes. The health and educational outcomes are better in other communities. So this isn't rocket science. We as a nation must put resources and talent and, and funding and support and include the voices of community to rebuild the infrastructure so that families have what they need to be able to raise children that are prosperous and joyful. You know, I grew up in this town and I'm a product of the Detroit Public Schools. I think I was nine years old when I realized that we didn't have any money, that we were poor. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and why? Because mm -hmm. before then, my parents created an environment that made me think that we were just doing fine. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. Right. And 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 that is not necessarily what what we see today mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of uh, kids getting what they need from parents. However, it's not lost. No. Okay. I think that there's something that we can recapture yeah. as 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 a community, uh, and and it's that that's not necessarily a, a black issue either. I mean, this is across the board. Well, we see this uh, issue is all over the place. Absolutely. So we may see. So look at mental health, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the rates of suicide, the rates of uh, acute depression, have gone up across the board. The difference is before COVID. Even. Before COVID. Yes. The difference is is that when white children have these issues, their child they have access to the psychologists and the therapies that are needed. Our community doesn't. And then we also have the issue of, of stigma relevant to that. But you did say something I'd, I'd love to pick pick up on is that in spite of all of these really, quite frankly, challenging facts our level of poverty, uh, the level of illiteracy to functional illiteracy that we have, uh, the economics, all of that's true. But our history shows, particularly black people in this nation, that through the resilience of family and, and faith and a focus on education, we can have the resilience to overcome and create communities that are self-sustaining. And I think that's part of what we have to do in educating our community too. And you know mm -hmm. what, the kids are smart. I, yeah, I, right, you know, yeah. I, I, they, they, if they can learn all the words to a rap song, they can learn anything. In a hot okay? second. That's mm -hmm. right. So here again, we just have not <clears throat> refocused mm -hmm. the energies that we need to as parents mm -hmm. in a household, even as a single parent. Half of, the, half of my friends from childhood only had one parent exactly. in the home, and they did very well in life, okay? So we, we, we need to focus back on, on the things that are missing to do that, but back to the Detroit Parent Network yes. for a second here, okay? You guys, you say you've been around for 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Where does your funding come from? 
predominantly in foundations. Okay. Um, because of the work that we do, we, we're a niche. We have authentic relationships with grandparents, aunties. We're, we are multi generational. Uh, and so we don't fit into an educational box. We don't fit in social services. And so what we found, quite frankly, is it's quite challenging at times to be able to tap into those funding streams. But what we have are some wonderful foundation partners who understand how critical it is to have parents at the forefront to support them in the training. So, you know, I always love to lift up our, our and I call them our partners because they're making a co-investment, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, uh, the organization like the Fisher Family Foundation, McGregor, the Skillman Foundation, have consistently looked at community-based organizations, and particularly Detroit Parent Network, and been supporters of our vision, which is a multi-sector collaborative approach to empowering parents. So yes, we work with schools, but we're not funded by them. We work with social service agencies, Head Start. We work with colleges and career, because we're about how do we make our children bloom from the cradle to career and, and beyond? Because you're 70 years old doesn't mean you stop learning. Absolutely. Um, so to create wonderful opportunities to build the village for even the elderly. So our funding is, as I said, is predominantly foundation. Um, we are also, like many other organizations, trying to figure out. Uh, there's been gazillions, an unprecedented amount of money that's come in uh, to all of the, the states. And, and we're trying to train up our parents from a policy lens to say to systems like education and health, how are you being accountable for the use of those dollars in a way that gets the outcomes for our children and families? From a political standpoint or a leadership as, as a thought partner with many, we're also saying those funds need to be shared amongst community-based organizations that are also part of the solution in creating the, the, the safety net um, across the board. But to do that again in partnership with schools and colleges and, and healthcare systems. Uh, and at some point in time that we really try to get beyond uh, all of us being in our own silos, and, and bring and, and blend funding. If, if you're doing something excellent and you've got a, a pool of funds for that, then how do we begin to blend that exactly. in a way that gets us what we need? That's one thing. But the other is saying at the systems level to both uh, our legislators, uh, to Congress, and, and even to our mayor, how we need you to redistribute dollars to have out of school time. I mean, when, when, I, when I was in elementary school, I went to Thurco, right over on, <laughs> right? Am I near you? Okay, so <laughs> yes. yeah, a, great, a great deal of my child, I grew up on uh, Euclid, uh, right off of Linwood. Okay, uh, you know, right across the street from Linwood in Franklin. Nebraska. Go ahead. Yeah. Where? <laughs> Linwood in Nebraska in Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, well, so we knew when we went to elementary school, there were all these after-school activities. Absolutely. Now, where do children go between 3.30 and 6 while mom and dad or uncle and grandma are working? So we need to make sure that we have those supports again. And with these kinds of funding that's come through, through ARPA and other opportunities from the Biden administration, and even from our governor, Governor Whitmer, uh, so we see more school-based health clinics. We need more. We need more opportunities for community-based programs and parents to have vital after-school programs. All of the stuff and we guess used what? to have. Health has got to be in all of that. Yep. All the stuff mm -hmm. we used to have. There was a school nurse. Yes. I mean, who picked up a lot of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just a runny nose, but you you really need glasses, kind of. Yes. Thing. Okay. Yes. All of those things have we we fallen away from them. We, well, we're, it got divested. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So here we are at the great Wayne State University campus, a, a jewel for this city. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right up the road, 30 minutes up the road, University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would be remiss. Mm -hmm. And you know where I'm going. I see it on your face. <laughs> there is a role that higher education mm -hmm. should be playing in this whole discussion that we're talking about, your idea of blending resources, yeah. not just the money, but the talent as the talent. well, okay, is a, is, is, is a slam dunk for me in terms of how we turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. Detroit Parent Network, I know you got that on the radar yes. in terms of where we go with, with, with uh, um, well, everybody so who's offering degrees and a thousand curriculums. Right, well, one of the things, so Wayne State University is special to me for a couple of reasons. 
one is that my father was one of the first black sociologists here. Really? Um, so I grew up as a child, my father bringing me to the classrooms while he lectured, I had the, the back room. Exposure, he, yes. environment, yes. Mm -hmm. That kind of enrichment was priceless. But even where I grew up though, uh, right there, as I said, on, on Euclid off, off of Linwood, because he had that opportunity, everybody else did too. Because so when Jametta and Jim, my brother, we were taken to the library, the uh, rest of the kids got in the station yeah, wagon with us. With yeah. Now, how does Wayne State fit into that? I know from my background that these, these famed halls, I felt that this was my due. I never saw this as something else that was unattainable. It was part of your inherited DNA growing up as a child. E exactly. The educational component. The education was important, right. and I was blessed to have that. I was blessed to have two parents that, uh, back in the in the in the 40s, you know, got college educated, uh, started an adventure going to India to teach there, and I, I'm their progeny as a result. I'm the brown <laughs> package they brought back to India. They always say. <laughs> But why Wayne State is also so important because it is the largest institution with the greatest number of black students in the whole nation in terms of a majority mm -hmm. white. Also because of its research, I think Wayne State in particular, we work with MSU, Oakland, U of M, all of those. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a particular role for Wayne State University and I'm, I'm excited about things that I'm hearing Dr. Wilson talking about, uh, the Warrior Way Back program, mm -hmm. the opportunities that they are now saying, and this is where we come in, there are now opportunities between what the Detroit Chamber is offering, like Detroit Drives Degrees, to get adults back into opportunities to not only get back to college, but to be able to wipe out previous debt because that's the whole issue. And in and Wayne State University, that if you have a certain kind of background and you need additional support, whether that's transportation, assistance, et cetera, is there's a program for you. And, and so when you think about college or cradle to career, um, that's not a role just for the universities, but the university has to do it in partnership. So there are universities that need students, there's the business sector that needs the talent, and so all of that, if we, we, we pivot it, the reality is, is that we need parents and we need young people on pathways getting the support that they need to get that extra hand holding coaching and support to get onto that runway that gets them into a Wayne State University that helps them to know that there's a workforce development uh, system that's out there where they can be trained. Um, we've got to do a much better job of that. And, and one of the ways that with Detroit Parent Network, uh, what we do is we do a deep, what we call parent-to-parent, P2P, peer-to-peer coaching people to facilitate them going to the connection to the next professional. Uh, so we did that with, with health care. Uh, during COVID, we trained up family health advocates, basically as community navigators. And so these peer-to-peer -peer relationships are the ones who were connecting people to primary care. They weren't doing primary care, they were connecting to primary care, behavioral health, where food is. I'm looking forward to partnering with Wayne State or others about, well, let's develop a core of parents that understand this system more, that are working with families and communities and congregations and being a connector to higher ed. Because it doesn't matter how, much, how many beautiful buildings we put in places like this, the students are not looking like the city of Detroit. Will we learn the lesson from the pandemic? These issues are pre-pandemic. It took the pandemic for us to take a look in the mirror for us to recognize that we didn't like what we saw. Yeah, okay? true. I mean, are we, how many pandemics, how many issues, how many yeah. social types of, of, of setbacks do we need to, to get us on the right track to, 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 to the momentum that we need, you know, yeah. the juice that we yeah. need to move these Well, things. Well, I, I think the reality of it is, is it, it points to the, the contradiction and the promise of this, of this nation. Exactly. The reality is all of the, the poor outcomes that we see, uh, the lack of inequity is, is deeply entrenched in who is America and how it was founded uh, when we look at both structural racism and ethnocentrism and the systems that have been built around that uh, of keeping certain people in certain places and access. Until we begin to actually have those conversations and really have a, a willingness to 
create change and make people accountable for the changes and the policies and the legislation to, to change that, then it's only going to be people wanting to work together who are going to create change. So and that's not the, sufficient. So part of the conversation, mm -hmm. the entities at the table, are not just the kids who, nope. you know, who we, we bless their hearts, okay, uh, but the parents who mm -hmm. have a, a difficult role now, as you mentioned earlier, it's, this is a new day, okay? It is. <clears throat> the, the educational community, the business community, and government. We have a fear in this country that government's going to take over and tell us all what to do. And which, but black people generally don't have that fear. No, no, they don't. But I mean, yeah. oh, there's an overarching, prevailing perception. Particularly with the last... Okay. Elections, person who was in exactly the, the okay, and office. and and the the tribe that follows that, exactly. that thought right. process, okay. But here again, if we leave any one of those entities out, yeah, we, we we're going to pay for it. Yeah, and we are paying for it. So the the question becomes, and that's what I think is hopefully part of the conversation here, is if we look at even the guest list for this summit, I I, I was delighted. You know, so we see, uh, you know, Dr. Vitti, we, we see schools, we see health people, uh, community-based organizations, because it is going to talk, take all of us talking together, but the reality is, too, is how are we talking? Mm -hmm. What are the power dynamics yeah. that are at play? I can't be the steamroller in the room and roll over everybody because else. Because you have... Because you're, I bring the resources. Right, because you're the $80 million program yeah, and someone else is $8,000. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I heard one of the other speakers that I really loved what he talked about is people with talent and purpose coming together. I think that's our opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have brilliant and beautiful children. We have brilliant, caring, and dedicated parents who need, like anybody else, support. So how do we modify what we're doing both at the grassroot level and then we also have to be willing to be a equity warrior at the grass top level mm -hmm. and I think that um, that is something with the Detroit Parent Network and other partners uh, in social justice we have to be willing to do. It, sound, mm -hmm. it sounds to me like there is a <clears throat> underlying theme or an approach with uh, Detroit Parent Network uh, that, that encompasses a lot of these things but no matter where we move in this country or in this society, we still have to deal with the R word, the, the, oh, yeah. the racism that comes through, whether it's in, in, at the C-suite or, mm -hmm. or at the coffee shop. Okay? Exactly. Uh, so, so how has your experience been? And we know that there are ways to deal with this. What has the experience been at Detroit Parent Network in terms of successes, mm -hmm. you know, make, making inroads? Well, I think one of the things that's really important is, if, for example, in our training, we have what we call core training. We provide training to parents around, you know, good skills for parenting, parent advocacy and parent leadership. And I'm really so excited. What we've been doing with our advocacy and leadership training, we're actually helping our parents learn what many of them never knew, which was that cities like Detroit, had self-sustaining, thriving black communities Absolutely. that had excellent schools, mm -hmm. that had uh, professionals, that had people while they were still working in the plants, there was someone else in the family who was also going to college. Exactly. That, they, that we come, that's part of our DNA, that through the disinvestment, through the, uh, the, the attacks on, uh, that happened with housing, uh, with the, the, the sucking sound when major corporations moved out of, this, out of this city and we lost property value and property taxes, all of those things that the average 30-year-old right now that has two children hasn't a clue about what this city was and that at one point it had the largest black middle income group in the entire United States. So why we're talking about that in our parent advocacy and leadership is we're saying, okay, let's look at what, who Fannie Lou Hamer was. Let's look at Dr. Osias Sweet. Uh, let's look at how they organize themselves to sustain their families and sustain our communities. How do we now use that past looking from like almost a Sankofa lens to go back and fetch it. Let's look at what's been in our past that enabled particularly black communities. We had the same conversations with Hispanics and others, but what helped give us the resiliency to overcome circumstances that quite frankly, which, which more dire? 
I mean, you know, our parents lived in segregation. Absolutely. Uh, we lived in situations where you knew that your home could be attacked if you moved in the wrong neighborhood. Sure. Uh, I, I grew up knowing what it was like to have uh, white kids show up at your mm -hmm. junior high and want to beat up everybody there because we were going to get sent to their high school. Mm -hmm. I lived that. Mm -hmm. I lived being a student where you, you were turned down to, to go certain places because you were the black kids. But look at where we are now, because there was something built into us to have a sense of value and worth that no one else could take away. Now so you, that's our job. You overcome, we overcome those things because you had the support, support. system. And we had First role all, models. You didn't have money. No, it wasn't. Okay. I mean, it, and the if finances, you had money, that was okay. That was okay. But it was about being of service. It was about being I'm of service. I'm a Spelman service. woman. Uh, so, you know, know, it's all about <laughs> being of service. My, my family, my my grandfather was a Presbyterian minister, the first mm -hmm. one in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that little church, I was like, how much? How did all that magic happen right. there? Yeah. Because the belief was of being of service first. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So basically, with less, mm -hmm. we did more. Yeah. Kind of not the path we want to take now. Everybody now seems to be of the mindset that says, if I can't do this and I can't have that and I can't, you know, yeah. touch all these yeah. bases, then yeah. I can't serve. Yeah, everybody can serve, regardless of, of income. Exactly. And if we can rebuild that sense of service. So, you know, whether you're, you're you know, like, like my mother, my grandmother, you know, had three different businesses. You know, she to get her two daughters through college, she, I, I think she had a hamburger place at one time. Another time was, was, was a, a butcher shop. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things that are important for us to share in our community so we don't perceive and we know this value. We also have to, I think, as parents and as black folk in particular, we have to say to our children that because someone has a six million dollar um, offer, now a contract, and they run a football or they play a basketball or they're an entertainer, those are not the heroes for our children. Exactly. It's you, parent. Exactly. It's, it's Mr. So-and-so exactly. who's the janitor, who's consistently loving, caring, and kind. Uh, it's, it's, it's you, Lonnie Joe, who is using your talent and your expertise to, to bring up these issues and share them back with the community. We have to start talking about our heroes and our sheroes in an entirely different way. And if they're not your parents, something isn't quite right. You should never get to graduate from high school without recognizing what your mom and your dad actually did for you and instilled into you and how you want to make them proud going forward. Yeah. Okay? Here yeah. again. We raise our babies that way. Exactly. Yeah. It, that's just yeah. right. We we have a disconnect here. This could go on for know, a very right? long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. This is uh, very insightful, very helpful. And I am sure that um, we are going to do this again in some shape, form, manner. Our, our producer, uh, director, has all kind of ideas that are just well, exciting great. for this sort of stuff. So, And we'd love to do that yeah. and have some of what we call our parents' power for policy change exactly. that are working on health issues exactly. and health equity. We'd love to be able to have a conversation. Very good. Thank you so much. We'll do this again. Thank you. Very Looking good. forward to it. Excellent. Our guest today has been the president and CEO of Detroit Parent Network, Jametta Lilly. Uh, we've had an exciting discussion here, and we look forward, as I said, to doing this again. For Primary Care, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe.